everyone. Welcome to another awesome day of FileMaker Training. Uh, Rich Carlton here with another awesome day at, at uh, YouTube, Twitch, and Discord. We broadcast in high definition uh, Monday through Friday on that. And so today is kind of an open Q&A day. We haven't had one in a while. Today is open question and answer day. Jacob Taylor is here. I don't know. I guess I could press the control button over there. See, is Jacob, is your screen? Yes, I am. Are you screenable? Can you show your beautiful face? I I can share my. You can pick one. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, oh, I have to share in Slack. Hold on, let me operate the computer. Share. Do you want my face or the screen? Now uh, show your uh, face. We'll start with your face. We'll do some er okay. early Q and A. We have a couple questions and answers coming up already. There's Jacob Taylor right there. He loves orange. Him and Margaret are like my orange freaks. So what I want to do is we're going to answer. We're going to look at some questions that came up a little bit ago. I'm going to ask the first. We have the first question. Question from Scott Kane. Has anyone tried to use OData methods on a Linux served file? So first, I think you should explain what OData is and kind of how that might be used with FileMaker server. And then maybe answer the question after that, Jacob. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, we have not worked with anybody that used OData, um, that I'm aware of anyway. Um, but what it is, is, is it's an alternative to the data API. Um, and it follows, uh, I know we have said the data API is rest like, uh, OData is, it follows the spec for rest. Um, it will be very familiar to anybody who's used other, um, they're called CRUD update mechanisms. Um, and that's create something update Cre and delete cre create read update and delete yeah. yeah yeah or yeah remove update whatever something like that so and that's a standard set of operations you can create an api that is compatible with them um they're very generic uh they usually allow um i guess you would call it like programmatic exploration so you can ask the the OData endpoint, hey, what actions can I take on you? And it will give you a list back and stuff like that. And so your program is capable, like if it understands what a CRUD API is, it is capable of figuring out how to use this thing without you having to program in every individual command. Um, keep going, keep so, going. I'm going to adjust the color here a little bit on the screen, but keep going. Okay, cool. Um, so... There, so again, we haven't worked with that per se. Um, however, I do have one, uh, they were outside website consultants of one of our clients actually, um, who successfully did humorously uh, a FileMaker Cloud 2 integration using the OData API. Um, they found it much easier than trying to use the data API on Cloud 2. So, um, and what they were doing with that was uh, pushing data back and forth. They had some sort of a sales platform. Um, it wasn't one I've heard of, uh, but it, you know, it has its own database basically. And so they programmed in that it could push data back and forth from FileMaker um, so that you can do the standard stuff everyone always does, which is right, keep track of your invoices and products sold and inventory and this sort of stuff um, inside of FileMaker. Um, but they were doing it on FileMaker Cloud um, in this case, because that is one of the platforms that OData runs on. Uh, it is worth noting, as always, when talking about OData, it is only available on the Linux-ish versions of FileMaker Server. Um, and so that is the new Ubuntu uh, FileMaker Server and then Cloud 2 as well, which is uh, Linux-based. Okay, so to be very clear about it, OData is a way of getting data out of FileMaker Server or data into yeah. FileMaker Server or both? Both, both. It's a it's a it's an alternative to the data API. Okay. Yeah, we never have used that before. Now I hear people talking about using OData for authentication. Would you like to? Did you did you address that right now? Because I was adjusting your color a little bit. So. Uh, no, I did not address that. I. That would work the same way as anything else does. You there's a login endpoint and you get a token back. So it it works a lot like OAuth or exactly like OAuth. I'm unsure. Yes, the one after that was from, I believe, Ed Burkle, which is, do I need a clean install as an FMS point X updates come along? Yes. Next hey, question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, Jacob thought at one point that you could get away with updates, but then I, I there said, was There was precisely one of those that I endorsed, and I suppose I will stand by my previous endorsement, but it only applies to literally one version, so... <laughs> Yeah. Um, FileMaker Server 19.2 specifically seemed to do a pretty good job of uh, doing an in-place upgrade. Um, they, 
you know, Claris made the claim that uh, the full installers uh, in the 19, in stream of 19, if you, you know, run a full installer on a certain, you shut everything down and, and do, you know, run the full installer, it will basically upgrade you in place. Um, that worked on FileMaker Server 19.2 in my testing um, and in my, uh, you know, production experience. That was fine. Uh, it did not work before that and uh, has not worked since. So. Um, I have had um, from small issues to uh, staying up until 10 p.m. because it destroyed a server level issues. So okay. uh, do not recommend clean installs. It's the old advice, basically. Um, continue following it. Okay, good. Next question, Margaret. Okay, just from Scott. We just cleared the third quarter and no new version of FM was released. Or was 19.3 in the third quarter? Uh I Claris is on a ro a rolling release schedule of when they feel like it, right? So I need to be very <laughs> clear about that for people. So um, I'm not quite entirely sure what we need to do on that end of things with them. Uh, it's up to them when they release. It's not necessarily going to be annually. It's not necessarily going to be quarterly. It's but it's it'll be more often than annual. But when they feel like it, I've seen them as far as take as long as four or five months to deliver an update, and as short as three weeks to do from one rev to the next rev because there was some sort of major dependency problem with all that right so yep. yeah i i think the i think they are we'll say aiming for quarterly um and a lot of people keyed off of oh quarterly updates we're gonna you know april one uh you know is q2 okay we get an update on april one or two something you know thursday that week um it's not gonna be like that i i think in general they are aiming for quarterly updates whether they deliver that is an entirely unrelated question. Um, and so, yeah, they, they've got some big fish to fry in terms of their FileMaker 20 release, which I guess they're going to call 20. Um, I think they're still trying to find their way with all this. So, all right. Okay. So the next question. We have another question from Ruben. Yep. Uh, with cloud servers, you cannot schedule scripts, but you can with the admin API. Is this recommended by you guys or is it better to wait for FileMaker to come up with a server admin tool for cloud server? Um, okay, say that again. Was it talking about that, cloud, talking about cloud uh, two, cloud two, cloud servers? You could not schedule scripts. I thought they added like that back on the, in the admin console. I, yeah, I was gonna say I, I don't they, remember when that is. That should be if if you're talking about cloud two, that should be in the product already. Again, it should be back be, in the product. Uh, yeah. Think of it as the feature has been restored. Um, you will you there's a there's a I haven't looked at it because I haven't logged into one of those in the last several months. Um, but there is supposed to now be the ability to schedule scripts server side on cloud too. Yeah, that's supposed to be in there. So um, yeah, I'm not sure why that's not there. Would not appear to be there. So um, yeah, I don't have cloud too. I I had a demo of it. Claris would very much like me to uh, give them one thousand five hundred dollars for me to demonstrate to you a product that I should have. Uh, but, uh, for, I don't use it and because I don't use it, I don't have it. And because I don't have it, I mean, I, I at one point I paid for it for a couple of years, but after that, I got tired of having a product I never used and didn't demonstrate. So, um, yeah, so there you go. So there's your answer to that question, which is kind of sorry. Right. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I wish I could demonstrate it, but you know, I don't, I'm not going to write a check 1500 bucks to answer, uh, Ruben's question. Sorry about that, Ruben. Feel free to buy uh, the buy that yourself, and then, uh, or you can invite me in, and we can work on it together, right? So, <laughs> uh, other questions. Okay, we got one from Gudidi, which is a paragraph. So mm -hmm. brace yourself. That's a uh, I have a I have a supplier that has a spreadsheet that contains their part numbers of the field that contains a file name for an image. They also have a download of all of the images. I have imported the spreadsheet into a table. Question, is there a way to use the field with the image name to open and or load the image into FileMaker? Some images are used for multiple part numbers. Okay, so I have a spreadsheet that contains part numbers with it contains an image, a file a file name for the image. They also have downloaded a uh, download with all the images I have. I imported the table. Mm. Is there a way to use the field with the name? Right, on Pro. You can do it on Pro. You can't do it on Server. Right, so server is is sandboxed, right? So that's that idea where it can only read and write in and out of the 
documents or temp directory on FileMaker Server. On FileMaker Pro, you can script it to read that, right? We actually, so Gaditi, what you want to do is take a look at, download a free, a free, a fresh copy of Starting Point. And let me see if I can just demonstrate this for you real quick right here. I'm not going to give you the exact line of code for this because it's kind of, kind of unnecessary. Um, let me see if I can just hide all this stupid stuff here. So starting point, here's a copy of starting point. I'm going to open it up and it'll say, yeah, that's starting point 20, whatever. I'm going to get rid of the upcoming broadcast schedule. Um, and so if I go to contacts right here and I have these documents right here, what you want to do is take a look at the scripts right here. So if I have like this is a, this is a uh, fed, this is the Federal Bureau of, of Investigation ID for Jacob Taylor, right here. It's oh, yeah. F, uh, yeah. So here's a great image right here. And so in order for this to open, I, I'm gonna actually I can run the script debugger and you can see this happen. But you have you have everything you need. You already have. I'm just showing you where to find it. Half the battle with the FileMaker platform. There's so many resources just even with our company that it's just finding what you're looking for. And so that's sometimes the best questions here are just where do I find stuff. So. Here this is right here. So I've got the script debugger. I'm going to click on it. I'm going to say open the selected. Now, in order for us to display it, we have to tell FileMaker to export it on a path, right? And then we have to tell the computer to open it, right? And so you're dealing with the same kind of things here, right? So it's going to perform. I'm going to zoom in over here. So I uh, we're going to watch it over here. We're going to step down. Uh, user board off, blah, 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 is, it, are we, uh, get the uh, parameter, uh, is it coming out of this is what it's saying. So the answer is no. So then it's going down here. Let's see. Da, da, da. Yeah, it uses the, this repetition thing. It's a repeating field. Don't worry about that. It's this path stuff right here. So what we're going to do is we're getting the path to the temporary directory on FileMaker Pro. And then we're going to basically create this file name. So we have this the final path is the directory and the file name together. And then we say export that contents to that location, right? So you do that, you do that. It's export to the temporary path, which is kind of hidden. And then we tell it to basically, uh, did I mess that up? Oh, no, it opened it right here. So this is Jacob's uh, ID, right? So that's his ID. So, so we pop, it pops it up. So that's the kind of stuff you're looking at is taking building the path with that script so that script that you want to look at just for fun is uh it's right here it's a uh, script 2001 and starting point uh, 20 right so look at script 2001 to give you some ideas about building the path and then what you would do is it, you could import uh the image in that way if you wanted to um there's a couple there's a bunch of different things you could do with it but that's what you want to do mm -hmm. all right yeah uh, uh, you want to add anything to that, or are you good with that conversation? I was going to say one one big loop would be my kind of recommended approach. You're going to take that the pack of the pack of images that your client provides, and then that field that you hopefully have in your database that has you know uh, images slash and then maybe product ID 123.jpg or whatever, and you're just going to cycle through all of those records and match up. You know where you're the thing that you'll hard code probably is like where those are on your i don't know desktop downloads folder wherever you put them um accessible to pro and then just loop through and and vacuum them in yeah you're so. going to load them into a container and uh, not a, a externally stored container field so that way they get loaded on the server and then you, everyone can access them they're not just on that local directory except yep right if yep. they're actually if the images are actually in Excel, I don't, you might be able to get to them either with a monkey bread plugin, or you could probably get those images within the Excel file with that or a uh, scribe plugin from 360. Either one of those probably would, but I think monkey bread would be more universally interesting for that. So that's a good one. Yeah. He might have additional. Yeah. As I say, Christian might have Christian Schmidt who hasn't been here that. in a while. He got tired of us right now buying, you know, everyone buying <laughs> his product, but yeah. So, Hey, Tawa, how's it going? Michelle Gravel from Montreal. Welcome. Next question, Margaret, you want to read it out for us? Yep, one from Ken. Wondering what folks do about end user documentation for a loose solution they wrote. Um, not beginning FileMaker, but using the solution itself. You know, we had a, a gentleman here who was here a year ago. We haven't seen him in a long time. It's one of those things, if I don't answer your question, people wander off. And I, the problem is he wanted, he wanted like a button that you push that would write the user documentation for us. And, and how do we do that? And I'm like, uh... <laughs> There is no button that just that it explains to people how to use your software. 
I, I, I think if we had Nick here, he would say, well, if you need the introduction manual, you're, you, you have failed at building your app. It's an abomination. It should be self-evident as to what it is, right? So that's Nick. Um, to a degree, he's correct. He's correct about that. But sometimes there has to be end-user documentation. I don't know what to tell you. Screenshots and what I, it's not something we normally do because most customers, they're involved with us during the development, so they already know how it works, so they don't really need an instruction manual on how to use it. Uh, with starting point, it's free, right? And so once again, we do training videos that you can buy to get the documentation, but we don't have like a printed manual like on it because it would be, I mean, this is, frankly 2020 and 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 very few people even really like my you know like doing the book thing very few people want printed documentation it's really kind of a an older user kind of thing the younger people want either a video or they don't use it at all right that makes sense so yeah. i don't have any thoughts on that besides well, I, shoot, I shoot videos for people when they want a demo like that you just you do something you it, you know it can be formalized or not but it's like you know, uh, if you're like, if, if there's a bunch of interesting ways that you need to deal with your invoicing process, for example, um, or, or, you know, it's like knowledge that needs to be passed down because, uh, you know, okay, the, the app is reasonably straightforward to use, but, you know, you have business process differences or there's some interesting things that you do in certain scenarios. Those do need to be written down or shot in a video or something documented, we'll say generally, um, somewhere. And so how you accomplish that, you know, depends on your business and how where your other documentation exists, probably. Um, I shoot videos for like how to use features or something, but like if it's a business process thing, that should be in a literal sense be written down somewhere, probably. Yeah. Ruben says uh, for his end user documentation, he does a popover button on the on the screen and then does a web viewer with the text and you can do it that way. So you have a, like a yep. popover and it, does, it, it doesn't have to use HTML, he doesn't have to use CSS, but the idea is that you, if you're in starting point, I'm just using that as an example, you're in here and you don't know what to do, you can press a button and you can have some built-in help or information up here what this stuff does, right? You can have it built in here. It's, that keeps it on screen so it's written you can even have a reference to a QuickTime video in here, right? Like this is a link right here. So if you want more information about that video training course, right here it is, right? So um, there's a bunch of different ways of solving that problem. Margaret, next question. Uh, we got, we got uh, Lynn. I, got, I want to do Lynn. Lynn has been very well behaved and I uh, want to hammer this one. Does it matter if server schedules overlap when they run? Uh, they tend to stack, right? So... So we're talking about FileMaker on PSOS, right? J Jacob Taylor, can you bring up uh, your server? I want to show this to the schedules. Maybe. Which one? Uh, any, fi any FileMaker server where we have backups right. or something running, and we could also. Uh, right. So basically, this is the question is the same here as it is for backups. So if you have backups right here, Jacob, hit that, and then you have your own uh, backup schedules here. It's the same idea, and so here, here's what I'm gonna I'm gonna lay on all of you real quick on this, basically. So, FileMaker server generally will run one backup at a time. It will um, do multiple PSOS scripts at one time, but here's the rub with this. So, um, if you have two backups that end up getting triggered, say one backup takes a long time and you have it, and it runs into another one, the next one is queued to start behind the, 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 when the first one finishes, right? So backups will stack. Um, if you tell the FileMaker server either with the schedule or with PSOS, where the client tells the server to do this, do it. So PSOS and the server, uh, if we go back here, was it in their configurations? Is that what it was? It was configuration where we had this the script schedules. Yeah. Right yep. here. So PSOS, PSOS is when we tell the server to run a script. This is the same process, but this is where we say every day at 12 o'clock or every day at the top of the hour, run a script for us, right? Same exact net effect, except one is a scheduled event, one is a trigger from a client telling the server to do it for us. Both are tremendously powerful. The rub is, is that, is that when we tell, when, my rule of thumb is when you tell FileMaker server to run scripts for you, you, those scripts need to be five seconds, 10 seconds, maybe a minute maximum in length. Why? Because if you write some really intensive scripting and processing, 
um, you run the risk of crashing that process on the server. A FileMaker server on Windows, Mac, or Linux, doesn't matter. It's not like really one program that's running. It's like five or six little programs that are running. So you have the main database engine, then you have a backup engine, then you have the script running engine, thing, and then you know maybe an admin engine that does whatever. And so the point is, is that if you, it's like FileMaker Pro. If you have FileMaker Pro run scripts over and over and over and over and day after day after day after day and over and over and day after day, and then poof, it blows up, it crashes. Same thing happens on FileMaker Server. So the chances of it crashing and having a problem are pretty minimal, almost zero, if it runs little quick scripts, five seconds, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, maybe a minute. If you have scripts that are taking many, many, many minutes to run, then eventually they will crash, and then that part of your FileMaker server becomes completely unresponsive and doesn't function. The server has to be somehow manually massaged, stroked, re repaired, restarted, whatever you want to do, to restore that that one program. So remember, FileMaker server is not one program, right? In our minds, it's one program, but it's a bunch of little programs that are running together, processes, right? We call them process on Mac. Is it a, it's a service on Windows, right? And so these things work together, but you could have one that dies and the rest of it's still running. So you have, you still have the database engine, maybe some backups running, maybe client access running, maybe web administration running, but the ability to run scripts is dead. And so now you got yourself kind of in a pickle. That's where we get into robots, why we have conversations about robots. So robots are what we are like FileMaker Pro clients that sit next to the server on the rack and they do all the heavy lifting while the server just does the, as much lightweight stuff as possible. So if there's a crash, it happens to our dedicated FileMaker Pro client and not to the server itself. So these are things that you only learn from experience. So here is Jacob, where we're taking a look at the services, right? So all those that say FileMaker right there, plus I think another one that's not even named FileMaker, right? It's one more. That's yeah, somewhere. there's this node one is one of them. This yeah. is probably WebDirect. Yeah. Go away, thank you. Okay. Yeah. So so these all these together, along with this one and these two, that is the, a FileMaker server installation. So you don't want to crash it. So if So technically... If uh, when you're running PSOS, it will attempt to run PSOS in parallel. Um, with SASE, it when they're scheduled, it tends to run them one at a time, and they wait for completion of, of the previous one. So that's like where at noon every day at 1 o'clock, it's going to run this. Well, we had a customer, I'm not going to name, we, we tried to work with them, and they were really, really hard to work with. And so we're, we don't work with them anymore. Um, but they, they were the kind of customer that they actually – had 26 hours of processing of scripts that had to be done every day. And so unless you're going to uh, hurt, as Nick Hunter would say, hurt the laws of nature and change the number of hours in a day, it was physically impossible for the FileMaker server to complete all the work every day that it had to do. So the script engine was running continuously. It never stopped. It never slowed down. Huge performance issues, and then it would crash, right? Never mind the fact that it was trying to do 26 hours of work in a 24-hour period. So what the hell? Then it keeps stacking and stacking and stacking until it all explodes. So it's not good. So um, the answer is, yes, you can stack them. If you're stacking stuff, think about getting a robot involved with that, Lynn. Does that answer the question? Right? So Mr. Lynn, right? So he, Lynn, yes. So um, does it matter if a, a FileMaker server exceeds the time limit but not set to abort, then a different schedule begins? FileMaker server is going to wait as a general rule, wait for the first uh, SASE, S-A-S-E, Server Assisted Script Execution. Um, that's an acronym I created years ago that Claris actually took up. Um, and what it does is, is it will wait for one to finish before it starts the next one. So, yeah, so if you have a bunch of them stacked up, then they're going to be delayed and they'll wait, right? PSOS will run in parallel up until you hit the maximum count. The maximum number of simultaneous PSOSs by default depends upon your installation. Anywhere from 25 to 100 is typically mm -hmm. the number, right? So, I've also I've also run into limitations with PSOSs where uh, it'll stop you at about 40 fired from a single client. I don't know if that number is different in newer versions. That is a number that I have tested in 18, so I don't know if it changes later, but. Yeah, so you should expect a limited amount of um, I would not. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, just I, to be I, clear, I don't recommend firing 40. I learned about that limit because uh, I pissed a few other people off at RCC by overloading our primary database server, and a couple of people were unhappy about that. So. <laughs> All right, yeah, so that's where the robot comes in. We've talked about sessions about robots. Margaret, if you want to do a search for robots in our live streams, we can post information uh, for Lynn about that because we've had the conversations okay. about a dedicated robot, I think it's. It's also in our paid training course. Once again, Lynn, if you don't have... Okay, <clears throat> hang on one second. This broadcast is brought to you by fmtraining.tv, where every day you get the latest and greatest in FileMaker training. Visit fmtraining.tv to support the channel and get the training you desperately need, including dedicated training for Lynn on robots. Check out our bundle section and purchase one of the bundles, and you'll get dedicated training on that topic. Visit fmtrain.tv and press the bundles button today. All right, there we go. There's your advertising moment, all right? So, it's in our paid training, and we also have some live streams we talked about a little bit. But the paid training is always better than the live stream, just the way it is. Just, Ruben's not there causing problems. David Learning's not there causing problems. When Ellen's here, she's not here causing problems. I miss that one. I don't know where her and uh, Jackie, Jackie Chan are at. All right, cool. Next question. Uh, next question, I think, is from it was something on Discord. Okay. But I'm looking. Do I see it? Oh, it was from Ed Burkle, I think. Uh, do we get this one follow up to the FMS upgrade question? Can I jump to FMS 19.3 without doing point one and or point two? Yeah, you can go straight to the end if you want. Yes. Would recommend it. There's no reason to step on the other versions at all because you're going to be, do again, previous previous answer to the previous question, you'll be doing a clean install every time. So uh, you'll just be installing and then uh, we'll install point one and then install point two and then install point three. And there's no reason to actually do that. Uh, just install the latest version. Yeah. Yeah. And the latest gonna, version is 19.3.2, 19, right? Two. Yeah. Yeah. We know they're working on 19.4, but I don't know that there's anything in there that's overwhelmingly amazing. Um, I think they're I think they're just treading water. It's like when you're teaching if you if you have kids, you treat teacher they learn how to swim. Some some parents teach their kids how to swim by grabbing the kid and throwing it in the pool, and then maybe with a little life preserver or something or something, and then they thrash around. That's the harsh way of learning how to swim, but that's you know. A little bit by what's happening. There we go. There we go. There goes the kid launching himself into the pool, right? How to swim, right? So there you go. Uh, yeah. They're, they're working on compliance stuff for 19.4. So it's another one of these. We won't hear about anything that they've changed in it, and it'll be little tweaks and cleanups and stuff. Um, very similar to the story for 19.3. Um, as always, I'm you know not expecting any explosive changes. Uh, naturally, they did manage to sneak one explosive change into 19.3 um, that wasn't on the change logs or any public things. And unless you find the right post on the forum, uh, it's not you won't know about it. Um, one cool thing, basically, the the changes, for example, on 19.3, um, they swapped out the how SSL works for the server. This, of course, caused problems for some people, but is generally recommended as to how they're doing it now. Um, and so enterprise people will be quite happy. Um, they used to, uh, Claris used to ship a, uh, a an SSL certificate root store, as it's called, which is, you know, so the server can like validate its own certificates and stuff. Um, and it used to ship its own copy, basically. Um, and that is, in a general sense, not recommended to do anymore. Um, and so if you're not going to be the person that like sits there and maintains all of that stuff, you should probably just defer to the operating system, Mac, Windows, or Linux, whatever you're on. They all have facilities to deal with all of that stuff. Um, and so they got rid of that. They're not shipping their own copy of everything anymore, which is great. Um, and then that caused problems because it turned out some people were reliant upon it being the old way. Um, so, um, but that's, it was one of those like little quiet changes. Nobody noted it anywhere. If you find the right forum post somewhere, you can discover that. Um, but it's generally actually a cool upgrade for people that are in enterprise scenarios um, where things like issuing your own SSL certificates, you know, signed by your IT people uh, is like a normal kind of business thing that you might do. Um, it's going to help a lot with those people. 
um, and most other operators of the server will not notice. So, I'm pretty sure that no code. So, uh, there's another question here, and we're, I'm going to bounce off of this one. Ruben's asking about have we heard of Caspio yet? Um, anyone who says no code, uh, I, I think that's always a problematic uh, strategy. Um, I haven't. There's about 50 uh, companies that are trying to do low code or no code. Um, I think if you're pitching yourself as no code, you're uh, not a very bright individual and you don't have a lot of combat experience because you're going to need um, some level of minor coding and able to make really awesome file, uh, applications at all, whether it's live code or FileMaker or whatever it's going to be. Um, if you actually have a, I, I've yet to see a no code platform that could compete with FileMaker in a serious way. So, yeah. um, I mean, make it a website that claims to do amazing sh is one thing, but actually if, if say that Ed comes to me, Burkle says, I want a CRM that does, uh, inspections and this and that and the other thing with very specific processes, uh, you're probably not going to be able to get there a real legit custom application with no code. Custom means code, some level of code, right? If you want, yeah. if you want an off-the-shelf system that just kind of does, sh that's called QuickBooks. Just do that, right? If you want, that's no code. Just so you know, no code. Just use QuickBooks. You just use what they give you and drag and drop a little bit, and off you go. Um, uh, yeah. no, a lot of the no, a lot of the no code ones are like it's it's a uh, it's Excel except you don't get the calc engine from Excel or whatever. Yeah. Um, and that you know they'll have little tools and they do basic reporting right. You can do time series off of your data and whatever. But like it it isn't and you know unless you just hate paying Microsoft seven dollars a month or something, it doesn't end up being that much of a an improvement. Um, and actually with even excel as, as a bad example frankly um you know you you have the that you have their calculation engine in it which there are thousands and millions of pages to help you with and books and everything else for basic coding stuff that you can do really cool business calculations with um and you are very quickly going to run into the limitations of a lot of a lot of the low code platforms as a result of that because I, no, you may not need much code, but the inability to do anything is it ends up being a limiting factor quite quickly. Yeah, yeah, and that's the rub with that. So, uh, Ruben was saying that, uh, they're the, the low code platform leader, but on their website says no code. So you got to pick one or the other, either low code or no code. Or if you're like Nick, then it's ho code, right? But uh, yeah, um, yeah. So I don't, I don't, I can't, I can't speak about that. If you can't code. Uh, it doesn't matter how great a platform is. There's not a single software application ever out there that can do everything. That's why we talk about FileMaker. It's a starting point. It's not completely done because you have to customize it. So that's how that is. Um, Did we get the question from Michelle? Uh, Michelle, will there be a webinar on how to save a PDF on OneDrive? Uh, it's not currently scheduled. Um, I don't normal. I don't personally use OneDrive, so it wouldn't be something I would do. Um, OneDrive, OneDrive, is that Google or is that the Microsoft product? That's Which Microsoft. One? Okay, yeah. So Is that dumping the file into the folder or maybe they have an API and that's what they're – You could. Pro it's probably like Dropbox or something. You you push it into push it into OneDrive via API. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a Mac user, so I uh -huh. use I, – I, I'm a Mac user, so I use Dropbox. I, if it was me, I would look at an AWS solution, right? Try not to get boned in the process. But if you have a company that's on OneDrive and they use OneDrive, yeah, I – I don't use it, so we have to find some uh, person uh, to do a live stream on that specifically. But if you can write, you can already write a PDF on Pro to, I mean, we've already did it over here. We just showed this, right? I mean, M Michelle, you saw this, right? We showed saving the path name, create the path name that save the document there, right? So um, we already have it in here where you create a PDF, right? You go through the whole thing. All you have to do is adjust the path to the path for OneDrive, right? Um, unless that, unless it's not a mountable volume or something, then you're going to have to figure out the API for that, which is kind of interesting because that's what uh, Stu was asking about. Stu's asking about Zapier. So Garrett is my Zapier. Margaret, can you call Garrett, see if we can get him on the call? But uh, uh. D just call him cold. We'll see if he wants to take the question. Um, Garrett's my Zapier guy, but basically Stu... The technology for talking to Zapier is really uh, curl, right? I mean, you're talking about a, a you're talking about a HTTP, HTTP request with a bunch of extra hidden little uh, 
bits of code in it, right? Which are the curl options, which are generally invisible. And so typically you're going to use a product, uh, a free app called Postman. Postman is a product that allows you to uh, help simulate and connect and test your connection um, doing REST API, which is basically a HTTP request with hidden options on it. We've actually talked about that in some of our live streams and some of our paid training. Um, so the uh, so then with Zapier, right, a lot of times when people are interacting with Zapier, Zapier or a service that connects to Zapier is a source of, of data for FileMaker to consume. A big part of this, we talk about this in the book, actually, because people get this confused, and I think that's what's happening in the stool a little bit, is very clearly in your mind uh, delineating between where there's an outside data source where it's being consumed eaten by FileMaker, as opposed to where FileMaker is the source and other people are consuming that. So the data is going the other way. If you want FileMaker to consume, uh, to be a source of data, then you're looking at generally the data API on FileMaker server on Mac, Windows, or Linux, right? Not even on Cloud2 because, once again, that's a sketchy kind of nightmare with that, right? Um, I guess according to Jacob, you could use OData for that, but I haven't done that. I used uh, the, the data API for that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we wouldn't be able to for, at least for our stuff anyway, because we're on the Windows server. And I don't believe the Mac, uh, I don't think the Mac one runs it either. Okay. Um, the OData? Anyway. OData, yeah, that's just Linux, right? Is that it's, as far as I'm aware, it's Linux only. Um, yeah. I don't know, maybe that changes, but yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway. So Lynn said, uh, can, okay, this is a different, totally different question. Uh, this Lynn says this, can the event log, this is a log written by FileMaker server, can the event log be sent out to me daily by email? Or do I always have to go to the folder and drag it out? Um, boy, I tell you, you're singing to Jacob. Jacob is, <laughs> Jacob would, Jacob would, it has sent many a message to Claris about, you know, what are you doing and why don't you get it together, right? So, um, how, how about a server schedule to import the event log in a FileMaker Sure. Can you? Why not? Well, okay. So, so why not? Because it's everything, sandboxed. No, no, no. Right. Everything that they're asking for can be done today. It's just not in FileMaker, literally native to FileMaker. You can do all of that already. Um, so, for example, RCC on new systems as of about ballpark of six months ago, um, we include the event log in our uh, backups, actually, so that whenever a backup on the server runs, we have a copy of the most recent event log at that time. So if there's anything weird, if there's weird people, yeah, whatever, doing stuff, um, we'll have a preserved copy of that. Um, how do you how do you, you move that? How do you move that? I, literally, it is a file move in PowerShell. It's not. There's nothing interesting about it. So okay. you could do the same thing, um, except you know, oh, you wanted to email it to yourself. Okay. Um, if you want to do half, so the funny way to do that, if you wanted to do it half in FileMaker and half not, is you put a very tiny, it'll be like a five or 10 line, maybe PowerShell script on the server that copies the event log into a folder. And then there's a scheduled script on FileMaker server, the folder being like the, the FileMaker server documents directory, for example. Um, then have a scheduled script on the server that does a file import into a container field or something like that. Um, and that would be perfectly reasonable. You could, or you could email it to yourself at the end of that script, whatever you want to do. Um, right. So, uh, and if you wanted it to be completely outside of FileMaker, you could do something similar, uh, except you, maybe you're, uh, in this case, I'm using the example of PowerShell, but you'd use something else on Mac or, or Linux. Um, your PowerShell could send it to you via email. And so it would be a little script that runs each night, grabs a copy, uh, maybe even zip it. Um, and then punt it off into your email inbox. So, right. you, yeah, you can do that, basically. The short version is you can do that. It's just not a, like, natively supported thing um, where you could, like, go to the admin console and be like, give me, you know, email me the log each night at midnight or something. Like, there isn't a pre can thing like that. So Yeah, you're going to have to uh, code it. And so if you want to uh, cut the corner, then you need to get with Jacob, I guess, figure that out. I mean... I don't know if there's enough interest in here to talk about moving the vent logs with PowerShell off a FileMaker server for us to do. Oh, a, a I could live show it. it. Yeah, I could show it. It's not. Um, uh, give me a couple of minutes to find a recent server. Okay, well, then why don't you work on that, and then I will take the next question. So, 
Uh, Ruben's talking out loud a little bit, so I'm going to grab the Discord on that real quick. So Ruben, people are going back and forth talking about uh, a f something called FM Gateway. I don't use FM Gateway, um, but they used it. He says they used it for a year, then the product didn't work so great anymore, and then there was issue with support. Yeah, well, it's a free product, right? So what do you expect, right? So that's what I think Ruben is saying that. He's hesitant to make your business dependent upon a free product for which there is no real tech support. There's no model for that, right? You know, it's like FM Starting Point. We will provide uh, tech support for it if someone writes a check and pays us for it, right? Um, we might answer a couple random questions on email, but if people start really ripping questions off, they need to buy the training, one, or they need to uh, pay for some tech support. And so, obviously, if, if you could pay for tech support, you'd probably get better support for, for FM Gateway. So, it's a way of connecting uh, to uh, to Zapier. So I, I, I know that my engineer, I guess we tried to call him and he didn't uh, take the calls too bad, uh, does a lot of Zapier integration or he has before so he could speak that in great detail. Um, but there you go. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, that's the rub with that, right? So you don't, you don't want to be, you know, you know, and I run into this, it's kind of this kind of conversation that's coming up on Monday. You know, uh, yesterday and today and Monday are kind of like, things that as a file maker developer you run into them it's all the issues that are not really the most technical issue but tech the technical stuff is an important part of it what is the cost of filemaker what is your expectations of filemaker when do you want to rebuild your filemaker solution because it's a giant basket of dog doo-doo you know it, or maybe it's great and you don't have any issues right you know all these are important questions that come up and um and one of one of which we run into is people uh, you know, I, I, I love free software uh, to the point where you're demoing it, trying. You want to actually have people you're in business with be making money, be making money and they're profitable and happy and well-adjusted adults, right? I don't know how else to say this. So you are, there are people, it's called a win-win solution. People say that's kind of, uh, I'll find, I'm going to find the book and I'll bring it on Monday, but it's a win-win. Is that you want a win-win. You don't want a deal. There's people out there in life who are life is a competition. In order for them to win, they, they have to feel that you've lost, right? So that's a win-lose situation. And so then you have a situation where people don't want to do business with you. And so they go away, right? You want, like, for example, if Larry and Ken and my Marines and everyone was out there promoting RCC, I would want them not only to be promoting doing a great job because we do a great job, but I would want them to somehow benefit somehow from that promotion. I want them to be rewarded for that, a win, a legitimate win-win, right? And uh, and so people lose sight of that. And that's a really, uh, I think it's an overarching thing and we see it all the time. Oh, here's a free solution. It's great, right? Well, our, you don't have to worry about starting point. We've had it for 11 years. We continue to update it because there's a business model behind it where we make money. But if you have a free solution to give away for free, there's not really a long-term strategy for success. You need to be worried about that, right? You need to be worried that the people on the other end are still going to be in business. It's like Postman. I don't know why Postman's free. It's a great application. I really hope that somehow the people who make Postman have a paid business model so they can keep making that great product for free. Because whenever you have a really great product, that's totally free you know i i worry about i really legitimately worry about that so anyway so sorry about that i'm kind of ranting a little bit but uh yeah it's a win-win you absolutely want a win-win right so other questions uh you ready jacob to do a little power shelly thing yep all right so we're gonna we're gonna jump back to hopefully lynn is here lynn are you still here lynn i, re I require lynn to report in lynn are you still there Report it. Yep. All right, here we go. Yeah, so I, the very basic version of this, so all of our Windows servers have a backup system that runs every hour on them. Uh, you can kind of get the gist of what the script does, and I think we've covered this in some detail in, in a previous stream anyway. Um, but my little very minor addition here, which does kind of what it says, you're copying something from what this, which is the FileMaker server logs directory. I know you were asking about specifically the event log. We grabbed them all because I, I don't I don't see why not. Um, 
and then where and so we're grabbing what we're grabbing stuff in that location and then where are we putting it we're putting it there um, that is a magic directory for our backup system that means anything in that folder gets backed up that's the short version see data is back zipped and uh, put places the zipped copy of it is put places. Um, and then this final thing means recurse, uh, like recurse through directories. So for example, uh, 360 works. If you have one of their plugins installed on their on your server, like like email, for example, um, it'll have plugin logs inside the FileMaker server logs directory, right in here. Um, but it'll be like 360 works email. And then there'll be a couple log files in there. Um, and so this makes sure that all those are picked up too. Um, and that's it. Uh, all it does is it copies it into the appropriate location. And then when we get down to this step, which is the zip, this is the actual, we use 7-zip as the application. Um, it, it zips up the data and then it gets put places. So it's, uh, as far as, you know, if you already have a sort of backup system involved somewhere, either on your own server uh, or, you know, some kind of process like that, it, it may be as simple as adding you know, the FileMaker server logs directory as another folder that gets backed up as part of the same process. Um, this is the equivalent to that in PowerShell, but, you know, there's many different ways to accomplish the same thing. All right, so if you're not familiar with PowerShell, then you're going to have to get a little experience with that. If anyone wants to hire Jacob, he is available, unfortunately. It does cost money. We're back that win-win <laughs> thing. There's only so much free things we can do for you. Yep. So uh, other questions. We're kind of coming up at the top of the hour here in a couple minutes. I want to try to set the plane up for landing. So we're on our uh, downwind for landing. If you have any comments or uh, questions or ideas about a session, like if 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 uh, Michelle really, 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 really wants a, a webinar session on PDF to OneDrive, shoot us an email. So send an email to Rick. Actually, send it to support. Send it to support at rcconsulting.com. It will go into our triage tech support area. That's where you people send questions anyway. Send a question to support at rcconsulting.com. And what we can do then is uh, put that on our task queue list for broadcast scheduling, right? So we do that. Because uh, upcoming broadcast schedule, we talked about that probably a little bit. The upcoming schedule... Um, is pretty neat. There's some uh, things coming up. Authors, uh, Monday will be interesting. Then Tuesday, we kind of take a different angle on it. But I did want to point out, if I go back to the database over here, if I go to recent, and I go to CMS, uh, we've got the uh, ransomware stuff coming, scheduled, it's coming up. But we are going to take off for the week of uh, Thanksgiving, right? So that's kind of the st strategy with that a little bit. So this is today. And then on Monday, we're going to be doing a little bit about licensing, then PCI, right, uh, which is basically PCI compliance, which is basically protecting credit card uh, things like that. So that's a, kind of a conversation. Um, you don't want to be in the middle of, of being having a data breach and then losing people's credit card information. This is bad, 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 bad. And then Christian Olson is going to be running the broadcast here with Hair Watson, Hare Watson, Hare Watson will be here to, to show all amazing developer tools that he has built along. A lot of it has to do with monkey bread. So I don't know if Christian Schmidt will be back for that, but it's going to be some epic level powerhouse developer stuff uh, with these events right here. And then uh, Klaus Levent will be back. Hopefully Margaret's going to be setting that up to talk to Klaus. Uh, about that and uh, he will be here doing a revisit of SSL certificates he wants to talk about that go through that process it gives Jacob a chance to take a breath <laughs> so Jacob doesn't have to do all this uh, yay. I, yay so uh, that'll be coming up on November 2nd and then we got some more Nick and then more Hare, Hal Watson and then we've got a couple open days that are here and then uh, we get into uh, we're going to a bunch of stuff in here ransomware whatnot and then we're taking uh, no live stream, right? So we're taking a no live stream scenario on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. That's a week of Thanksgiving here in the United States. So those of you familiar with that, if you're not any doing anything that week, you wonder where we're all off. Um, Apple typically takes that week off. Uh, Claris will take that week off. And then they also take off a week uh, in Christmas too, I think, or two weeks in Christmas. Yeah, so uh, once again, if you missed today, all these events are recorded. How do they find the recordings, Margaret? What do we do for that? You can download the... Uh, they can download the video player, right? Don't they get the video yes, player here? You can download this right here. Once you have the video player, you can come over here. You can fire it up, and you can find all the latest live streams. It'll do a quick update on getting the latest material. 
You can say selected course over here. You can say daily live streams, which are free. And then these are all the latest ones here. And these are updated as of uh, tw the 20th. So this is the pause and error recap right here. So you can click on this. Uh, you can also, I think, if you, is it an option here about where you can actually tell it to open it in uh, another window? I have to figure out where that's at. But yeah, pretty neat stuff. So um, yeah, so that's how you can see the latest ones are also dumped in our YouTube channel. So as you watch the YouTube channel, you can ch you can find them there, watch them on YouTube there. But the uh, this is all the the latest content. So for those of you eHack250, if you missed us, uh, definitely uh, check out the recorded versions of this. And, and once we do the events, about two days for us to clean it up, remove all the uh, not safe for work terminology um, and any other not safe for work things. You know. That's it for today. We appreciate it. We'll see everyone on Monday. Monday is going to be about understanding the cost of FileMaker. So once again, not super technical, but kind of important things, uh, mental things. Uh, I'm going to bring uh, some essential sections of a book uh, to reference as uh, my material. So that's it for today. Appreciate everyone. All the hard work and a lot of the moderators there, everyone here, appreciate your hard work. Jacob, thank you for being here. Absolutely. Catch you Monday. quarterback to give you a chance and that's all you can ask for trying to rally down 10 925 to go here in the fourth short motion by Amendola from the left Brady takes the shot to step stands in throws it left for Amendola reaches up and snaps a high throw and lands inside the 10 Ooh. rolling to the nine Ball slightly behind him but Danny makes the grab